Okay, let's get started. This is the uh, second class of the DC Controls uh, sequence of classes, and the title of this class is Intro, Intro to uh, Circuit Breaker Controls. Uh, before we jump into the meat of the class, with safety tip. And today's safety tip is how to open a molded case circuit breaker. This is a humble molded case circuit breaker, about two dollars at your nearest Home Depot. And it will be mounted into an AC or DC uh, 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 panel. You probably have some of these, you know, one like this in your house, or there's one in this building. Certainly uh, ubiquitous in our uh, world today. When you're going to operate these things, particularly closing them, don't stand right in front of the thing. One of their failure modes, if they uh, uh, exceed the fault current interrupting rating, is simply to have uh, an arc flash that uh, extends outside of the, of the breaker and you'll get burned. And on, in some applications, you can be burned badly. So, don't stand in front of it. Stand off to the side and do that. That way, if the breaker fails on you, you'll burn your hand, not your face. Okay, today's class, uh, first off, you need two drawings for this class. If you do not have them in your hands right now, please stop and get them. Uh, you should be able to get them, download them off of PLC, and if you can't, please contact your department manager, and if that doesn't work, please email me at eric.hale at powerinch.com. Okay, in this class, we're going to talk about circuit breakers. Now, last class, we introduced basic logic for, uh, that, that we use in uh, control design for substations. In this hour, we're going to introduce how that applies to uh, circuit breakers, and we're going to look at a typical DC schematic uh, for a substation circuit breaker. And first, we're going to talk about uh, zones of protection, and then uh, we're also going to look at some pictures of circuit breakers, just to give you a better feel physically of what we're talking about and what, what one of these devices actually is like and how it works. Okay. The first uh, s shot I have up on the screen is are three depictions of how circuit breakers can be shown on drawings. Now then, the first one right over here on the left is really a depiction that I would use for a molded case circuit breaker uh, and probably not the most appropriate for a substation application. However, I have seen that symbology used for substations, so if that's what your client uses, well, so be it. Now this next one looks very similar to the molded case circuit breaker. However, this depiction comes from an old style oil breaker in which there was, the way these things work, there, was a, a, there were actually two contacts within this big barrel of oil. And there was a plunger with a, a spring on it that would, would pull these things up to make contact and then you had two bushings coming out the top, and that's the basics of how each pole of the circuit breaker was, and that's what's depicted in, by that symbology. Now then, the most common way you'll see circuit breakers in substations shown is just as a simple square, and if you see that on a drawing, you know that they're talking about circuit breakers. Okay, I'd like to talk now about zones of protection. And I've actually got something on my whiteboard over here that is a little bit better than that, that, uh, that I've got depicted there. Now then, this is meant to show a, a breaker in half configuration. These are six circuit breakers, and in my fictitious substation here, I've got a transmission line going off this direction, a transformer this way, and then I'm protecting a bus over here. And in red, I've got the, the, the AC circuits uh, coming out of the, the current transformers. These little squiggles are current transformers. Now, what this does is it creates different zones of protection within uh, our relaying scheme. And this is a really important concept. For instance, and, and the zones of protection are defined by the, where the current transformers are. And in modern dead tank circuit breakers, they're closely associated with, although not exactly the same, as the circuit breaker. Now notice on this, where we're connecting or paralleling up two CTs right here, running them into what I'm calling an 87B, 
which is a bus differential relay, and that creates then a zone of protection that any fault within that area, you're going to trip these two circuit breakers using this relay scheme. Now similarly, on our transmission line, we're going to have the outside two CTs on your breakers are going to be parallel together and they're going to run into a 21 relay, which is a line relay, and then that's going to create a zone of protection that encompasses all of this and your transmission line. Now then, on the, this, our, our transformer, I've taken currents from outside of these two circuit breakers and then one off of the low side circuit breaker and run them together into a, a, a 87T relay and that is a transformer differential relay. And you'll notice that we always overlap the, uh, the zones of protection. So there's nothing in the substation that's not at least part of one zone of protection. And in the case of the circuit breaker, you're actually in two. So you can see that if we had a fault here, you're going to pick it up with this relaying scheme and you're going to trip these two circuit breakers. I hope, hopefully that makes sense. If this is not clear to you, please get with your department manager. And if that doesn't work, please contact me. Now then, in a, a different uh, configuration, this is a radial bus scheme. And to protect the zone of protection, or the, the zone that is the, uh, the main bus, we're putting uh, CTs on the far side of, of each of the uh, circuit breakers. <coughs> and we're running them to a bus differential relay. Now for each one of these breakers, the zone that would be from this CT looking this way, we're just using a simple uh, overcurrent relay of 5051. Okay, if there's any questions on this, it's real important that you get this straight because it's very fundamental to uh, substations. Okay, I want to look now at some pictures of substations and particularly of circuit breakers. <clears throat> Okay, the first picture we've got is from a, a, a substation in Southern California. This is 500 kV, and uh, these are really, really big circuit breakers. Uh, and, you know, A pole, B pole, C pole. Uh, and the interrupter for the uh, circuit breaker is actually inside of this cylinder. These are the bushings, and then your connection is made at the top of the bushing. Uh, on a, a four or a six hole pad. Now notice that uh, since this is EHV, it's 500 kV, you have to put corona rings around that, otherwise you'll uh, get really unacceptable uh, corona uh, and gets real noisy and snap, crackle, and pop. Now then, this, the current transformers are actually external to the bushing and they're underneath that cowling right there. Now I say external, they're not immersed in the insulating gas of the circuit breaker, rather they're on the outside of it. Now then, since these um, are, are spaced too far apart to be mechanically linked together, they are electrically linked. Okay, here's uh, an, another uh, circuit breaker, completely different voltage. This is a 72 kV class uh, circuit breaker, but all the same features are there. We have a control cabinet in the front. We have three poles, you can see the uh, uh, leftmost pole as you're facing the circuit breaker here. Again, the interrupter is inside that cylinder. And that cylinder is full of SF6 gas, which is the insulating medium uh, for these breakers. Again, the CTs are located underneath uh, the, uh, the aluminum cowlings that I, I'm putting the cursor on right now. And then you have uh, the uh, bushings. And then on top of the um, bushings, are the pads that you connect the, uh, your conductors to and then off to disconnect switches on either side of the breaker. Now here's kind of an interesting one. Notice on this, and I think we'll see it in, in the next picture as well, notice this little bar here. Uh, i just ask you if you've uh, ever seen something like that in the substation, ask if you might be able to figure out why they put that bar in there. And uh, here's the answer is, this is in Southern California, and you've heard of acid rain. Well, actually, in Southern Cal, they have a problem with acid fog. 
And so when they get foggy nights, you will get condensation actually on the conductors. And if they didn't put these little standoff bars here, that condensation would actually roll down and it would trickle down the bushings and it actually lead to flashovers. So anyway, that's kind of an interesting little factoid. And this uh, breaker is actually the same substation. This is a, a 230 kV breaker. But again, the same exact principles. You have an insulator, excuse me, you have an insulating medium inside of these cylinders and your interrupter is right inside of there, connects to two bushings coming out of either side. And again, your CTs are uh, inside of these cowlings. Now, a lot of the stuff we're about to go through, the actual physical devices that make up the, the, the protection or the, the control scheme that we're going to be uh, looking at here shortly are housed in the control cabinet right inside of here. Now, <clears throat> these breakers, um, uh, and it's usually 230 kV and below, are mechanically linked together. So all three poles will uh, operate in unison. And uh, this is a breaker I was at the substation was at, uh, that day. Obviously, it's out of service. And it was sitting off to the side, and it was kind of an in interesting thing. Right down here in this breaker is the spring. In any circuit breaker, you have to have a, store, a stored energy mechanism. And what most modern circuit breakers use is a spring that is, oh, it's, I'm going to say it's 10 to 12 inches wide, and it's a series of steel plates that are concave, and they're they're uh, turned alternating on top of each other. And then there's a big uh, uh, motor associated with it that charges it. And what it does as you're charging it, it pulls down and flattens out those steel plates. And they can re rebound and release that stored energy very quickly uh, when called upon. And by very quickly, they're going to do it in just a couple milliseconds. Uh, is the actual time that the spring releases so that overall that circuit breaker can operate in roughly two cycles, which is about the time frame that we, we need the thing to operate on. Now then, <clears throat> the way this particular circuit breaker operates, that spring, uh, it, it releases its energy, and then it, you'll see right here there's some writing on this bar. Well, it says caution, shaft rotating. That's how <clears throat> it actually makes the, uh, the three poles uh, operate. So anyway, uh, if you would pull out your, uh, the drawing, the first one, which is an outline drawing of a circuit breaker. <clears throat> now starting at the, at the top left, there's an awful lot of, of, of good information on this drawing that you're going to need for your, uh, for your design. <clears throat> now, up here in the top, you'll see just a plan view of the circuit breaker, and you'll notice that the bushings are numbered. And that is very important because that numbering carries through to the wire designations for all the, the uh, leads coming off of your current transformers. And if you don't follow this right, you're not going to wire the, tra the, the current transformers up to the proper relay scheme, and you're not going to be able to achieve what I just showed you about overlapping your zones of protection. So very important that you get that part right, and your frame of reference is built around where your control cabinet is. And not every manufacturer uses the same scheme. I one time uh, did a project where uh, I thought I was getting uh, one manufacturer's uh, uh, breakers, and the last minute after I was largely done with the design, it changed to a different manufacturer. And what it meant was, out in the field, uh, they had to rearrange my design because every single circuit breaker, uh, the, the wiring was, uh, for the CTs was backwards. Um, and it, well, obviously, we picked that up very quickly and, and revised the, the drawings. But I just bring that up to illustrate the importance of that one facet. Now then, uh, going on the top over to the right is a bunch of very good information that you're going to need to design your foundation and a little information here about 
where you can run your conduits to to get your control wiring out of the circuit breaker and into your raceway system which will then take it back to your uh, control building. Over on this side is a, a, a face view of the breaker and again this is going to give you some really good information particularly about the physical dimensions of your circuit breaker and then over in this drawing you're going to see a couple real interesting things. Notice that this is the height of the bushing but look at this height up here. That's the, the clear space you will need above the circuit breaker to be able to remove a bushing. And every now and then, uh, you, that, that need does arise. Similarly, to do maintenance on the interrupters, this is how much clear space that you will need. Um, there's additional information on this side that you can read through, and uh, all of which, at various times in your design, will uh, be key uh, to, to uh, you getting your work done and getting it done accurately. Okay, if there are any questions on this, please uh, consult your department manager. Now then, I'd like to go on to the next drawing, and this is one we're going to spend quite a bit of time on most of the rest of this class. And before we dive into the nuts and bolts of it, I'd like to point out that this is ladder logic representation. And there are a number of DC buses. I, I'm moving my cursor right now along the two main ones. But notice you have another DC bus over here, and it extends down here to your motor charging circuit. And notice there actually is an AC bus here, and that runs uh, the heaters in your circuit breaker. Now, for those that are uh, not initiated to this, uh, we always put heaters in control cabinets because you want to make sure that they stay dry. And particularly on cold nights, maybe it's been raining, maybe there's a lot of, of moisture in the air, you'll start to get condensation in them, and that can really degrade the ability of your uh, circuit breaker to operate over time. Now, if you look closely at that, you'll see that half of those heaters are on all of the time, and half of them are controlled by a thermostat. Okay. I have a question for you. I want you to kind of put down your, your pen for just a second, and I want you to think about this. Now, most of you do not know me, and if you do talk to someone that knows me very well, they will let you know that I am not the most patient person in the world. So one day, I go home, and I want to watch television. My TV's dead. It won't work. So, unbeknownst to me, what has happened, is someone has taken a paper clip, opened it up, folded it over, and jammed it into a wall outlet in my house, and it's on the same circuit as my television. So obviously it's tripped the breaker, but I don't know that, so I investigate and I go to my AC panel and I find that circuit breaker. I find the one that is tripped, and I'm really not very happy right now, and I'm in my most impatient mode, and so I do this. I close it, and I hold it closed, what happens? I want you to turn the video off, take a piece of paper, and write down in one sentence what you think will happen. And we'll pause for just a moment. Okay, so what happens? I asked this class, and I, I really have to tell you that I actually enjoy asking this question, because I almost always, I'd say 80% of the people will say, you're going to burn down the house you're going to cause a thermal failure because you're going to run so much current and you, you're not letting the breaker trip. Eric, why are you not doing that? It's because I'm impatient. But that's not the right answer. Now then, usually about one in five to one in ten will say, oh, Eric, the next breaker upstream, which would be the main breaker, that's what's going to trip and it's going to clear the fault. Close, a little closer, but that is not correct either. What happens when I close into a fault and hold it closed is the circuit breaker trips. It doesn't care that I tried to hold it closed, it still trips. This is a property of circuit breakers that's known as being trip free. And if a circuit breaker is not trip free, it is not a circuit breaker. A this is a fundamental 
reality of circuit breakers, and it's a really important concept that I want you to have an intuitive understanding of. Now, think about this. Instead of, we're, of us using this little $2 molded case circuit breaker, let's think of a, a 500 kV breaker, or, or pick your voltage, on the transmission system. And I'm a station operator. And I do kind of a similar thing. Now, I don't know that there's a fault out there on the line that I'm closing in on it, but I take the control handle and I close it. And just to make sure the doggone thing closes, even though it closes in like a fraction of a second, I kind of hold it closed for a second or two. <coughs> well, a second or two on the transmission system is an eternity. Okay, we need, within two seconds, you could collapse the entire voltage of your system and lead to a regional outage. We need the thing to trip and remain open. And we accomplish this through a scheme called the anti-pumping scheme, which we're going to cover here in just a minute. And that will give all of our circuit breakers the characteristic of being trip free. This is absolutely essential for how we protect the transmission grid. We're back to this drawing, and I'm going to cover a couple points that I'm actually going to jump out of my PowerPoint slides and, uh, and put that very drawing up on the screen, and we're going to go through it in, in pretty fine detail. As I mentioned, this is a trip-free circuit breaker, and there is a scheme right over here that is known as the anti-pumping scheme. And to pump a circuit breaker means that you put a standing trip and a standing close on it, and pumping would be trip close, trip close, trip close. And what will happen is um, you'll get through about two or three cycles of that, then you're going to have to stop and recharge the, uh, the spring in the breaker, and then it's going to start right back up again. Trip close, trip close, trip close. And I, eventually some, something in the circuit breaker will fail. Most likely uh, you'll burn up either the trip coil, coil or the close coil. But we obviously don't want that to happen. And um, so that, that logic is right here in the scheme. And you'll want to pay close attention as we go through that. There, the, the close coil is located right here. It's that little uh, squiggly line. And all of these features right along here above it, are, which is not or logic, are the things that supervise closing. These are all the features that if that, that is not in the correct state, we do not want to close this circuit breaker. Now then, on top of this, if you take this lead out to your substation uh, control building, and we'll do this next class, there will be a couple more things that we're going to put on top of it, specifically uh, ANSI numbers 86 and 25. We will put those right out here and prevent closing if they are not in the proper state. Now then, within the circuit breaker for maintenance pur purposes, there will be a little push button uh, so that when you're testing it and, uh, and, and commissioning it, you can have control uh, locally on the uh, on the circuit breaker. Presumably at that point the uh, disconnect switches around the circuit breaker would be open. Okay, at this point I want to jump out of my PowerPoint and uh, actually uh, go straight to the uh, drawing that y'all are looking at and we will uh, kind of dive into this and really analyze how this thing works. Because as with many things in life the devil is in the details. So first, let's look at the anti-pumping scheme. And that's this scheme right here and this contact right here. Now then, to put it in a little bit better perspective, this is the closed coil for the circuit breaker. If the breaker is open and you energize this coil, then the breaker will close. Well, to energize it, look at all of the various uh, devices that have to be in the proper state before you can do that. Now then, let's assume that all of these devices are in that state, which uh, means that, that the breaker is open, hence the 52B contacts are closed, these motor protection uh, uh, and motor control devices are closed, 
and we have proper charging of, uh, of gas, which is SF6, which is our insulating medium. And we'll close it this time with this uh, push button, which is inside of the uh, control cabinets there uh, to help commission and test the, the circuit breaker. So that if you're a tech relay technician or a, a technician working inside of the uh, uh, breaker cabinet, you can control the breaker right there for the purposes of, of testing and measuring. And uh, presumably under those conditions, the uh, breaker uh, <clears throat> disconnect switches outside, on either side of the breaker are open. So anyway, we close this. And let's say that we're, we're going to um, close that push button, and, and we're going to leave it closed for a little while. And uh, so what happens is you energize the uh, closed coil, the breaker closes, and as it closes, that contact closes. This is already closed and you energize the 52Y. As soon as that happens, this contact closes, this opens it, and so you're going to seal in, and you're going to seal in through this resistor. That way, you're, not, you're, you're going to have enough current flowing through this, because it's limited by the resistor, you'll have enough current so that it stays picked up, but it's not nearly as much as it uh, took to initially uh, uh, have the thing change state. Now then notice, as long as this is picked up, that contact is open and you cannot, uh, uh, you cannot close the circuit breaker. Now this is really important and it's known as an anti-pumping scheme. And what pumping a breaker is, is when you have a standing trip and a standing close. And presumably what would happen is you just go trip, close, trip, close, trip, close. Then it's going to all stop while you recharge the, uh, the spring in the breaker. Then they'll go trip, close, trip, close. And it will keep doing that until something fails. Presumably you'll uh, burn up the close coil. Now then, notice that there's no mechanism within this circuit to uh, de-energize it and reset it. The only way to do that is to remove DC by opening up that push button. Or, if this, we were in the case where this is a normal operation, this is going back to your control building, uh, relieving uh, whatever the, the standing close is there. Now, picture I'm a, a substation operator, as I was mentioning before, and I've got the uh, control switch in my hand, and I go to close it. The breaker closes, but I close into a fault. Well, I may, you know, who knows how long I'm going to hold that, that uh, handle closed, maybe it's going to be a second or two. Well, a second or two is an eternity on the grid. Goodness, if you've closed into a fault, that may uh, be enough to collapse the voltage on your system and lead to a regional outage. So obviously we don't want that, and this is the scheme that prevents this. And you will see that through this process, through this anti-tripping or anti-pumping scheme, we are making the breaker trip free. Okay, now let's go through and see what the rest of these contacts do within our scheme. The 52Bs are status contacts, and every circuit breaker has uh, a stack of these, both 52Bs and 52As. And a 52A mimics the circuit breaker. If the breaker's open, the 52A is open. Breaker's closed, 52A is closed. The 52B is just the opposite, so breaker's open, 52B is closed, and vice versa. Now, the 88M has to do with this circuit right here, and notice that it also is in this circuit here. You actually have three contacts off of the 88M, and the 88M is essentially a, a contactor. It's a, 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 it can interrupt. Now, notice that, that this is a DC circuit, and you're using three of them and it's probably pulling a number of amps to charge that spring, big powerful spring, and so you're having to uh, uh, de-energize or interrupt DC current through that device, so hence you're going to use three contacts uh, to do it to ease the burden on those contacts. Now, above it, what you have, the, the, uh, this 33, is basically a limit switch, and it's 
placed on in in some location on the spring, so that as the spring becomes de-energized, it will it will go past a certain limit, and at that point, you got to charge the thing again, and what it will do is to start the motor up. Now it's supervised by a 49, which is, I believe, a thermal relay. It's something having to do with the protection of the motor, and you can see that it is also a part of the motor charging circuit. So that's where these two come in. It basically, if the motor is not char, or the, the excuse me, the uh, spring is not charged, you do not want to close the circuit breaker. And that's the idea with these two. Now then, here are two more contacts. These are 63s. Well, that's a gas pressure uh, device. And notice it has an X at the end of it. That means that this is actually a contact not out of the actual uh, 63, but it's an auxiliary relay that is operated by the 63. And here is its coil. It's right here. And there is the pressure uh, switch that is, uh, is, is going to detect low gas pressure. Now then, remember I told you that everything is going to be operated in the de or are shown in the de-energized state. Well, what is the de-energized state for a pressure relay? <clears throat> well, it's, it's shown when there's no gas in the breaker. So when you gas the breaker and, and it gets up to the appropriate level, you'll see that that opens. However, it, it, with this closed, you would think that that would mean that this would normally be shown energized, but it's not. It is also shown in the de-energized state. So through a little bit of bifurcated logic, we are indeed correctly showing B contacts here. <clears throat> and that's the state that they will be in when that is open. So it's B contact off of that auxiliary relay. Okay, the final device that we show is a 49M and our MX. And that comes out of this logic right here. And these are the various relays that protect the motor. If there's, uh, uh, among them uh, is a thermal relay. If there's something wrong with the motor <clears throat> and it is not going to be able to recharge that, uh, that breaker, we do not want to close the breaker. A and that's, that's why it has the functionality uh, that it does. If you have any questions about this, please uh, get with your department manager or someone else within your group uh, that can answer them for you. And again, as a last resort, email me at uh, eric.hale at powerinch.com. Okay, there are a couple other features of this drawing that I want to show to you. And um, these, this block right here and right here don't really have any function within what we're, I'm describing to you now. These are actually here to facilitate testing of the circuit breaker. Anytime you test a breaker, among the tests you conduct, you, you do what's called timing the breaker. And you have to uh, uh, put in, in this case, you'll put the, uh, the, the, this utility has probes that you will stick in there, and you'll be able to time the breaker very quickly. If you don't have this feature in it, you actually have to unwire, unwire this at a terminal block. And so if you think about that, you've unwired it, you've tested it, but how do you know for sure that you put it back in the right place? Anyway, they get around this problem. Uh, but with these uh, features, and it helps out a lot. I, I, I highly recommend this approach, both with the, the security that you know you haven't made an error there, but also uh, instead of taking upwards of a day to test a breaker, you can do it in a matter of hours. Okay, that's the closed circuit. Here is the first of the trip circuits. Right here is a trip coil. And notice you don't want to energize the, the trip coil unless the breaker is actually closed. So we're going to supervise it with a couple of 52A contacts. Another interesting feature is, well, first off, there's nothing else in this circuit. The, the, while the closed circuit, you want to 
make sure that there's a, a whole bunch of uh, features are just as they should be before you close the breaker. Once a breaker is closed, if there's a problem and you need to trip, you want to make sure that that breaker trips and without any problems, any, any uh, chance of failure or minimize the chance of failure. However, what do you do with the circuit breaker if you're running out of gas? If you have a low gas alarm or low gas condition? There are two schools of thought in this. And one of them is that you uh, block trip so that you've blocked trip and you've already blocked close. So essentially you're blocking operation of the breaker for uh, low gas. The other school of thought is that you block close and trip. And that's how this utility uh, uh, does it. And that is how this is wired up. And that's what this contact right here will do. Once you have gone to a, a, a condition of low gas and this auxiliary picks up, you're going to trip the uh, circuit breaker with that contact. <coughs> Now then, on the transmission system, most, uh, most circuit breakers have two trip coils. And this is the second trip coil. And notice that it gets its own DC uh, bus, you know, control voltage. And other than that, all of the features of this are identical to this. And in the subsequent classes, we will talk about the different uses of the second trip coil. Now then, uh, it, to close off this discussion, I want to actually describe to you what a trip coil is. All right, the way the trip coil works, if you recall last class, I showed you an auxiliary relay. We had one that was really big and had a big solenoid in it, you know, about yay big around. Well, a trip coil is really similar to that. You either have to have a lot of windings or a lot of current or both to produce a uh, good strong magnetic field. And, and again, it's a solenoid with a big plunger in the middle. And that plunger actually um, mechanically locks and prevents the breaker mechanism, <clears throat> you know, tripping mechanism from uh, tripping. Then as you energize the coil, magnetic field causes the, the plunger to pull out and everything trips and does its thing. Now, there's an interesting uh, failure mechanism that's kind of built into this that I want to uh, tell you about. And this happened in the early 60s. There was a big outage back uh, in, on the East Coast in upstate New York. And what actually happened, there was a type of circuit breaker that they had tri two trip coils, but they only had one plunger. So you had a, two coils over the same plunger. And what happened is the utility connected one in one polarity. The opposite, they flipped the polarity. And in this particular uh, protection scheme, they energize both trip coils at the same time, and the magnetic fields canceled out, and the breaker did not trip. Apparently, um, this, you know, again, goes back uh, um, until the point I was probably about a toddler. Um, they left an uncleared fault for over two seconds, and it blacked out most of the state of New York. So anyway, coming out of that uh, episode, there, were, uh, there was an updated number of standards. First off, it required that uh, all breakers have two trip coils on the transmission system. And it got rid of that forever, that design where you actually have the two trip coils on one independent plunger. All right, this concludes class number two. And in this class, we've introduced a number of concepts that are at the core of uh, substation control design. In particular, we've talked about circuit breakers and how they're controlled, how they work, what their functions are. And uh, we also talked about DC buses and then the various facets of the circuit breaker, including the uh, close and trip circuits. Uh, next hour, we are going to revisit many of these topics and then look at uh, a few additional topics uh, that go into the control of circuit breakers. Thank you.